Hello everybody, it is Monday the 31st of July and today I'm going to be talking about two aspects which are perfecting. In fact, tomorrow is August the 1st and both of these aspects will be perfect, meaning they will be exact angles um, tomorrow. And so I figured I'd better get a video in <laughs> while these are active and while a, doing a forecast for them would be relevant. The aspects in question are Mercury, which has just recently ingressed into Virgo, is going to be, is it right today is at 0, 03, and by tomorrow it'll be at 0, 05, and from which position it will be making an opposition to a retrograde Saturn in Pisces at the fifth degree of Pisces. At the same time, sharing the sign of Virgo is the planet Mars, which will be in a perfect square to Jupiter in Taurus. Um, I think that's at the 13th degree, but I don't have my, whatever. I'm just doing this as a video without any charts so you'll have to bear with me. But there were, but these both degrees are perfectly uh, perfecting by tomorrow. Um, and I also have a, for me this one is, seems particularly easy because the archetypal patterns are just sort of like, seem to be delivering themselves without even me really having to do much work to try to find them. And um, some of these, things that I was thinking about giving as examples may have more kind of nuance to them, but I thought I'd start off with an easy one first, which is more maybe mundane. Um, but the... My family was has a fridge that sometimes has problems in the in the summertime, and we were, we were defrosting the freezer, and I noticed that there's this one day, well, you know when your freezer gets a lot of ice in it and there's some sort of sensor that when you open your freezer, the light comes on? And for us, I guess if you have a sub substantial ice buildup, that may block the sensor from working. And so after defrosting the freezer for a little bit, suddenly the light comes back on, right? And so there's something about this is a kind of a... I, I'm not just saying that this is a good time to defrost your freezer and stuff like that, but you can see the archetype of the quality of cold, coldness, the fridge itself being a, uh, using the coldness as a way to preserve food over long periods of time, that the freezer itself is a Saturnian consumer product if there ever was one, right? Because you have both the la the whole thing of pres preservation over time as well as the, el the coldness, right? And then Mercury being the kind of technical, the problem solver and stuff like this. And this kind of like aha moment, this eureka of having the light bulb come back on, right? And that uh, I think... If you do enough, or if you do too much, even tarot and astrology and divination work, you may get to the point where instead of even reading stars or cards or something like that, you can even read things, what happens with your fridge as little divination moments, right? That, that, not to say, whatever, that maybe the, this, this is a metaphor of a light coming on, of something thawing out of, um, and anyways, what I was thinking of with this is that Saturn often, you know, what does it represent? It represents obstacles, it represents limits, limitations. And while recently we had a Mars opposition to Saturn, and, uh, well, that can yeah, feel kind of frustrating because it's the, both of the malefics, kind of like one foot on the gas, one foot on the brake, kind of this oppositional tension between the malefics. It's encouraging that Mercury is in Virgo now because Mercury has domicile as well as exaltation dignity. So it's a place where Mercury likes to be. And when a planet is in such good dignity, it is said to be protected to some extent anyways from the, the various malefic forces as in the opposition from Saturn, as in the co-presence with Mars and all this kind of stuff. So, and I also think that it's something to be to look out for because 
we're in a Venus retrograde now, which will last for a few months, but when Venus has done this process, Venus will be moving into Virgo, where Venus doesn't do very well, and then facing that same opposition to Saturn, um, which won't be, which will be more difficult, but this particular moment, the Mercury opposition to Saturn is a, is a, as such, where Mercury is well favored. Um, and there's a couple other examples. Well, I mean, I guess I can just speak generally of some of the themes that I have this feeling that, you know, it could very well be that the influence of Saturn is still felt on Mercury as a kind of a slowness or a heaviness and that with Mercury representing the mind and the problem solving and, and planning and all organization in, in Virgo, right, could be a kind of a fatigue around this process, but Mercury is well suited for this position. So it could also very well be the Mercury, the communicator, the organizer, the mediator, approaching difficult problems indicated by Saturn and the opposition, which Saturn is of the nature of the opposition and Mercury being well equipped to deal with some problematic issues or to mediate some obstacles, to mediate some barriers or limitations. And I think that I was looking at the news the other day and I saw a story which I felt illustrated this perfectly. And that was um, that there was an Iranian female chess player who decided to do a tournament without wearing her hijab which is against the Iranian law that women have to wear traditional, you know, headwear and whatnot, traditional religious garb. And this woman competed without it. And the news came in just recently that this woman was granted nationality by Spain. She's now immigrated from Iran to Spain. And now she can, you know, live her life as she chooses without the head garb and the, the hijab and whatnot. And the thing is, I also would just like to say that I personally, it's kind of a touchy issue politically because there's this whole thing about like Islamophobia and, you know, w w w as a white Western guy, ha whether or not I have any sort of opinion on another culture and how other people do stuff. And I don't, to be honest, I find it kind of confusing. Well, what am I trying to say? That the, the, the climate that I find myself in social climate and and what what how people in the public feel about these issues and one thing or another i don't know if i want to get into all that here right but that i think that we can look at the astrological dynamics of first of all saturn representing structures which have built up over time but saturn also representing the quality of lead a kind of a lead weight or something that's heavy that kind of weighs you down or the lead weight of ignorance or that there may be certain structures or certain traditions which are only there that are kind of like this old ignorant thing that you want to break free from and that with the well-empowered mercury being a kind of a mediator and negotiator it's like being able to make the deal with the spanish government to free you from you know the the traditional constraints that you're that you want to get away from and then at the same time, with Mars in, in that square to Jupiter, keep in mind that Jupiter is sharing the sign of Taurus with Uranus, which is all about kind of a revolutionary, rebellious, kind of uh, uh, liberating kind of energy. And Mars being a kind of, you know, goes with, if you're being a competitive chess player, there's a certain kind of that Mars-Jupiter confidence, competitive attitude, being playing to win or something like this that I, I feel goes with the story in some way, especially in Virgo, because Virgo is it's kind of like that com competition, but Virgo, Virgo is like the mental chess player who's thinking 10 steps ahead and all this kind of stuff, right? So I think that I, when I just saw that story, I thought I had to use it because I thought it f went so well with the, the specific astrological dynamic that we have right now. Um, but at the same time, you know, I don't know if I'd want to draw any sort of, well, it's a complicated political issue because I think there's this whole thing about people being anti-Islamist -is and people being, you know, pay, you know, building up a whole uh, 
ideology about like having an opinion about what what other people should or shouldn't do one way or the other and um i don't think i need to get into all that side of it right now but um you know i think we you know we live in a time where there's these polarizing political opinions and all this kind of stuff but that is that's one thing about saturn which can be a bit of an obstacle maybe is that saturn often represent i think well this is what i'm trying to kind of get at too is that often people i think this whole issue of traditional religious wear and stuff like that is that people uh, re will relate to this kind of thing as a othering kind of factor, right? Where it's like, if you are, um, the people, like when you're a pr people who seem like they're approachable versus people, like if you feel like somebody is too much of an other that you don't feel like, you know, they're too different from you, you don't feel friendly towards them, versus, like, can you communicate with people that are different from you, from you and find common ground, or is there tension there? And I think that but that basic quality of otherness that is also often highlighted by these different cultural things is um, at least Mercury, the communicator, the mediator, and the negotiator is well disposed in this particular dynamic to make some moves, basically. Like the chess player who's got their uh, strategy worked out or something like that, right? Um, and um, I, so I, I think you can, you can also extend, rather than just talking about this one specific example, that the Saturn could also have to do with things like uh, we're, you know, negotiating around where we're limited, like, if you, people, we're talking about people with disabilities, or if we're talking about care for the elderly, uh, talking about dealing with things like uh, negotiation and planning around things like Alzheimer's and dementia, or senility, or physical disabilities, lack of mobility, all this kind of stuff, that there's at least a you know, it could very well be that this is a time where, you know, you have an in innovative wheelchair ramp solution or something like that with Mercury in a position to, to do some work with the dynamic and the the limitation of Saturn being a factor, right? Now, um, with that all said, um, there was another angle to this that I was thinking about exploring, and that... Um, well, what can I say? I we had another book club meeting the other day, and this you know I min might have mentioned in a previous video that I did a Byung-Chul Han or whatever. I'm doing book clubs with the Weird Studies uh, student, whatever you would say. They we're not we're not this this isn't organized by the podcast hosts or the podcast uh, official administration, but. Uh, the all the people who hang out on the discord server server kind of have our little book club going and um i the last book club that we did was on uh the work of eugene thacker and we also watched the tv series true detective and the reason being is that there's this hold on do you guys know true detective I'm just making a recording here, so I guess asking this is not really uh, much of a question, right? But True Detective features a guy named, a character named Rust Cole, who is uh, well known for having a kind of a philosophically pessimistic or kind of a dark nihilistic outlook on life, and that I had only found out about this after joining or becoming a fan, <laughs> a supporter, a, uh, you know, whatever, a, uh, a rabid enthusiast of this Weird Studies podcast that, because there's all this stuff about, I have to admit that as there's so much about this Weird Studies that I like. like I, I've been a huge Philip T. Dick fan for years. I've been a huge Tarkovsky fan and there's a huge David Lynch fan. And there's all this stuff that have, I've, you know, I've been really into and regardless, but I had I had not really been familiar with guys like Thomas Ligotti or uh, the, I had never even heard of Eugene Thacker before. And this is kind of like outside the area of what I'm familiar with. And I have to admit that it's not something that I don't, I'm not really sure if it wasn't for being involved in this group, I'd even be that interested in the, this side of things or I'd explore it because I mean, you know, Thomas Ligotti is a horror writer who apparently the guy who's writing the script 
for True Detective, the first season, was a huge Thomas Ligotti fan and basically lifted a bunch of Ligotti's attitudes, ideas, even maybe some things he said in his books directly and just put them in the mouth of Russ Cole and built Russ Cole off this character of Tom. And he also went to a different sources as well, Eugene Thacker, who is like similarly, what kind of, what, like to basically to put it, to try to explain it is that this book, he has certain chapters on like prayers for darkness and prayers for nothingness. And I, um, I picked up another one of his books and they're talking about this whole chapters on the Gothic and stuff like that. And, um, the, I, there's something about this, which is like, um, I, I kind of got distracted and I didn't even finish the book, but I had, was overcome by this urge to read another book which I actually have here, Solaris by Stanislav Lem. And um, it's kind of related thematically. Um, I have to also admit that the other day, you know, a couple days ago, I made a video on Venus retrograde. And while I was like, I was reading this book, Solaris, and I was kind of thinking that maybe Solaris works as a kind of a Venus retrograde book because I mean, the whole plot of Solaris is like this guy is in a, not that really a space station, but it's a station that's orbiting this planet. And the planet has some sort of strange power to kind of like read the people's minds and then create physical manifestations of the deepest desires or the things that are lurking around in people's unconscious. And this guy has his ex girl. Was it? I don't think it was his wife. I think it was just his ex girlfriend or something that he had this tragic love thing where his, his ex committed suicide. And then he's on the space station and his dead ex girlfriend keeps mana re manifesting. And he's kind of tortured by the emotions around this. And it's, um, you know, there's movies made by Tarkovsky and there's movies, another one made by Steven Soderbergh in 2002, film adaptations. Um, but the book, I'd watched the Tarkovsky version many times, but the book has some great scenes in it that are depictions of the planet, namely the Symmetriads and stuff um, that are not in any of the films. And, and um, you know, I was, after reading this book, I was looking at, whatever, just browsing the Wikipedia page and stuff like that. And I think people were saying, he was saying that people love to interpret Solaris in different ways and, and make it like it's some sort of political statement or that it's about this or that. But he was, he was saying that his intention for the book was simply to write a science fiction novel that sort of illustrated the limits of rational human thought, right? And that the the novel Solaris, especially, I think there's, you know, with the whole weird studies thing, I think I was, JF was sort of criticizing the, uh, Tarkovsky's version and Soderbergh's version as in making Solaris more of like a love story. Like the whole, the whole center of what the story is about is about the man and this, uh, kind of uh, manifestation of his dead ex-lover who is haunting him and it's all and that takes the primary focus whereas in the novel that almost I mean it's all there like they, it's they do a pretty accurate representation of what's in the book but it's sort of like the book kind of expands beyond that in such a way that is like um like I said it's, it's less about the relational component and more about the, the limits of human thought uh, or the limit the the limits of the capacity of the rational mind right and um, the uh, the 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 book by Eugene Thacker starts out with this whole thing that's about philosophy the horror or I mean the the topic of these books is the horror of philosophy and the philosophy of horror right and the part of that has to do with the, the way that philosophy undermines itself in the sense that if you were, let's say, to, um, to make any statement about reality 
what goes on in life and reality. You have to make the start from this basis that there is actually reality and agree on the fact that there is a real world. And then from there, you can start making statements about it. But that philosophy has this ability to even question that most basic of underlying uh, positions that like to say that there is something rather than nothing and from there which we're making positives but what if we you know start doubting the very existence that there is something at all right and that he was talking about Rene Descartes and how Rene Descartes had this thing about um you know if what if we just take it for granted that the world that as we know it is uh reliable that if we see with what we see with our senses is a r reliable uh, depiction of what the real world is like, and we're not just hallucinating it all. Or as actually what Rene Descartes says is Rene Descartes gives us example of like, what if there was actually a demon who was creating your whole experience of reality as a trick to trick you, right? And that the I mean, this is he ends up Descartes ends up going this direction that this is an argument for. Descartes was actually a theist. He believed in God and that he believed that there, that the universe was in fact real and that the, 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 um, the intelligibility of the world and reality is there because we have the, uh, there's a loving God, you know, like the, a God that stands for the principles of goodness and that the goodness is there in reality because reality is intelligible and understandable and all this kind of stuff. But there's something about like the horror of philosophy as, as saying, what if that, what, what if even that was, how do we know that for sure? And what if it was actually a demon? And like, this is the kind of thing is that like, uh, Eugene Thacker is talking about like doing creative misreadings where people might say, well, surely Rene Descartes didn't actually think that there was a demon that was tricking him. But he was like, what if you, but what if you actually read Rene Descartes as if it was a demon that was, and, and taking all these philosophical things and then reading them in such a way that they're, they're more horrific or they sound something like this more out of a horror story. Right. And, um, or this whole thing about, um, he also spends a lot of time about like talking about the um, different mystical writers, right? Um, and how the, how mysticism is very often about how going beyond the limits of human thought and stuff, and having a kind of a uh, you know, if you the love of the divine is or the love of the transcendent is a love of something which. Can if it's beyond thought or if it's beyond conception, it's like you are. It's like you're you're loving the thing which is forever eluding you, which cannot be grasped in a, a language or cannot be communicated, and so you're always kind of failing. In in there's a kind of a futility, and there's something about all this which I think like I don't know if I am getting it across right, but it's like it like I mean. It could be come across as being very dreary and very depressing or something like that. But there's like, I think there's something about it, which is like, a, there's a kind of a joy that comes out of it. Or there's a kind of, and I don't know how to communicate that other than just kind of getting into it and then just enjoying it myself and not, but what I'm, there's something about all this was that around the time when I first uh, got introduced, well, when I first started reading this stuff or when I was getting excited to get into this stuff, there was, um, I don't know if I should get into this, uh, but yeah, I mean, why not? Um, I run into this problem. I don't know. This is one of the reasons why I think I should probably just not try to write stuff on Facebook <laughs> or maybe I should try to find different outlets for communicating my ideas or something like that. But I was basically there's something about my excitement for this kind of stuff, enthusiasm for this. And then there's a basic kind of quality that I find in the world around me, my immediate world around me, which I would describe as like a, the white picket fence quality or the, like, you, I mean, you know, when you, this thing where you like, if you go out for a walk and like everybody you see is wearing like t-shirts that are like Disneyland or like, you know, you know, like, or every, this kind of attitude of, I don't know. 
like it's not it's not like I a hatred of positive things, but there's something about like there's this kind of like joy in reveling in darkness or like this whole the the um I don't know like instead of like there's something it's like not it's not just like being uh you know a glutton for punishment or just loving being miserable but there's something about the fascination of the darkness and the mystery and all this kind of stuff and you know i was thinking about like to bring it back to the astrology with mercury opposite saturn you know like having difficult conversations right and i mean you're having a difficult conversation there's all sorts of difficult conversations you could have you could have be a boss who's like i have a you know, is you're going to lay off your employees and that's your difficult, or you're going to be a, a doctor who gives, you know, some terminal diagnosis and that's a difficult, but I mean, having a difficult conversation about the very limitations of language or the, the, the limitations of our own cognitive faculty to comprehend the reality that we're in and the, um, you know, the finite scope of human life in contrast to the infiniteness of the universe and the the perhaps horrific implications if you really start tallying up what that means for our place in the whole grand scheme. There's something about that which is nonetheless, I think, very enjoyable um, in some weird way. But there's something about trying to communicate the frustration with the the white picket fence Disneyland quality of the world I so often like feel is around me and my own kind of friction of rubbing up against that and when I try to I, try, I don't know I, last month I tried to sort of express that feeling and it just I feel like certain of my friends just interpret me as complaining when I'm kind of I don't know I'm just trying to uh I'm trying to just work with the material at hand most. I mean, you know, I, I have to admit sometimes too that I may uh, talk about the... I'm just trying to give it to you straight, basically, I guess that you could say, right? And I suppose there's a, um, you know, with Mercury opposite Saturn, part of the Saturn is that there's a certain... You know, we all have our own bullshit to some degree, right? Or we have all our own ignorance and we all have our own whatever, right? Um, but there's, you know, the, the I think with Mercury opposite Saturn, we have a unique kind of opportunity to kind of like transcend the bullshit or to be able to communicate in spite of our limitations or to... Um, I don't know, like try to get the message across or also to just dive into some difficult material and like actually enjoy it, <laughs> you know? Um, and I, I'm, I don't know. So this is a kind of a, uh, I'm having fun with this one. Um, hopefully, well, whatever. I wonder if there's anything else. I think this is pretty much what I had in mind for this idea. Um, and yeah, I don't know who's maybe who's your favorite goth philosophers. You can leave, leave comments in the, uh, in the, in the comment section or what's your favorite difficult reads? Um, what are your favorite ruminations on darkness? <laughs> Like, there's something, I don't know, there's something about, like, it's, like, this kind of, like, mortician, like, that's what I was trying to describe to my friends a month, month, month ago, is that there's this kind of, like, M Morticia Adams, Adams family kind of love of the darkness and aversion to the Disneyland white picket, picket fence kind of thing, and I just had this, I haven't had the point right now where it's, like, if you have to explain it, like, you know, maybe it's, maybe you're trying to labor the point to people who are not even, you know, who cares if they understand anyways, right? But so, so but there's this kind of thing where is I feel like maybe I should just I don't know. It's more and more just feeling like there's certain I don't know. Like again, if I'm putting this this video out, I don't know who's gonna watch it. <laughs> you know, like I'm just it's just like feels like leaving little messages in a bottle for whoever picks them up. And you don't know who's gonna get them, right? Um, and I just 
more and more, I just feel like, I don't know about Facebook. It's either a place where I, you know, I, I leave my creative stuff that I'm doing and get no response or I try to communicate and I feel like I'm misunderstood or, you know, it's, I think that could also be something to do with Saturn, like that kind of obstacle there, right? And that at least I'm given opportunities where I can get, really get into stuff and have conversations and, 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 you know, I'm feeling happy about that. Um, but just, you know, it creates a kind of a contrast where so often I just feel like, you know, you don't know how to, um, or the, you know, when I think of one of the things that I'm trying to express about it too, is that there's so, I think so often the when there's a kind of a grasping toward onto what's positive, like there's a kind of like, that why I've never really been into this thing about po positive affirmations. Not to say, it can be maybe helpful to, to remind yourself, to, you know, if you're feeling a lack of confidence to, to, to say something to like, oh, you know, I'm sure, you know, to affirm that, you know, that I've got this, I can do this or whatever, right? But like the idea of always trying to push away the dark and then try to bring in Disneyland or to try to make, try to make everything PG-13, family friendly, um, you know, up to the latest safety protocols, um, everything's bubble wrapped, everything is, uh, you know, safe per for public consumption. There are no eldritch monsters, you know, you can just, you know, have your pina colada and um, enjoy your summer day or something like that. I personally prefer the, you know, the the howling existential abyss of darkness of or the um like i was you guys have to like um i have to understand how much work never mind i'm not going to go on this one i'm just thinking about solaris and you know putting put the divorce by ejection or whatever right or like the uh um launch it, being launched into deep space or whatever right um I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if this makes any sense. Um, hopefully you guys get my sentiment with this one, though. Um, okay, thank you very much. And please like and subscribe, because it helps my channel.